Welcome to Career and Life Chats with Andrea, where I chat with lawyers about their careers and what makes a meaningful life. My guest today is Liz Blazer, an attorney turned professional comedian, writer, and actor. After graduating from the University of Chicago School of Law, Liz worked at Fried Frank as an associate before she began teaching law at Hofstra University. Nine years of teaching later, Liz completely left the law behind, launching instead her creative career. Liz has appeared on Out TV in Canada and opened for Mike Kaplan and Maria Bamford. When I think of Liz, the words fun, bold, and brave come to mind. I'm so glad you're here with me today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. That's, that's really nice. I don't know uh, whether you always do that uh, about the words that come to mind. Um, is that something that you always do? If I'm in the mood. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I mean, it's, it's such a generous way, um, at least in my view, you know, the way that I take it in is like a very generous, uh, I guess, not only compliment, but reflection of like, oh, yeah, I think I, like the, the, the reason that I, I take it this way is like, do you ever do the thing with like New Year's resolutions, not that any of them matter in 2020, you know, whatever. I, I like left my planner at my mom's house three weeks ago and I haven't been going inside of her house based on like where my wife has been for work. And so with quarantine and whatever, I'm very strict about it all. So I haven't had my planner for three weeks and I'm a paper planner gal and it doesn't matter. It does not matter. I don't need any type of schedule like notifications in 2020. But um, when resolutions were a thing, one of the things that I did based on, you know, reading whatever sort of self-help, et cetera, was like picking words, you know, like a word that, that means what this year is going to mean and whatever. And bold in particular, I remember last year, like last summer, I was like working with, with my acting coach and she was like, we need to get you to be bolder. And so when you say that, I think of, of that fun also reminds me of acting because that same acting coach, when I first started working with her had like a rubric to judge how people were doing in acting. And one of the rows on the rubric was the extent to which the performer is having fun. And at that time, when we first started working together, the thing that I had circled for that row in the rubric was fun needs work, which I thought was hilarious because it's like, how can you work on your fun? Then it's work, it's not fun, et cetera. And then with respect to Brave, uh, I, I've always like identified as fearful like so much of my personality is like working through fears. And so to be called brave is interesting to me. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to like overthink uh, your very lovely intro of just a few words and then I made them so many words. No, that's amazing. And I love that you do that where you pick words at the beginning of the year. I do the same thing too. Nice. And I think there's a lot of power behind the intentionality of how we want to begin a new year or really just to begin anything in life, whether right. it's a new chapter or a new project. So of course, of course, you are, you know, bold, fun, and brave. Well, <laughs> Especially you, when you're you do. Yeah. Well, and also like, I would say for you, if I may, you know, I don't know you very well, but you seem like a very patient listener, very determined um, the shout and then, you know, your whole website and how it, like, it seems like you really know what you want and you have a vision of it and you're willing to go after that vision, but also be very generous is another word with how you involve other people in that vision. And I, I just think it's great. And I'm glad we know each other now. That is so kind. This is a mutual admiration society and really shout out to Oscar Sagustame. Mm -hmm who connected us. It's the truth. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. um, and I understand Oscar has done various shows with you. And I'd love yes. to hear a little bit about the shows that you've done with Oscar. 
Um, if I remember correctly, uh, we did some storytelling shows together. And so I, in, in doing stand up, which I know that, you know, we want to chat about like the specific transitions, et cetera, but like, I never meant to do stand up. It, I didn't have the story of like, I've always admired stand up and therefore it was like a path that I clearly saw and went for. It was totally not like that. It was, I was teaching for nine years, as you said, which I wanted to do because I think I envisioned being at the front of a room, being like the person talking. And that certainly was like a comfortable um, role for me in terms of like, not that I wasn't afraid of it. I mean, one of my earliest memories is being on stage in a very traumatic moment at a ballet recital where I didn't know any of the moves and I just cried on the stage. Um, but like, you know, setting that aside and certainly I, I completely identify with stage fright, but I think it's it's been as big for me in terms of the memory because of how much I've wanted to be on the stage. And even that ballet recital memory arose out of wanting to know more what I was supposed to be doing on the stage, feeling like I had no idea what that was. And then by the way, learning what it was supposed to be and thinking that's not a good show. I think I'll just cry here and that'll be better, which I do think it was. But anyway, my parents disagree. But um, I, I knew that I wanted that. And so then I was teaching eventually, which like, you know, was a rough approximation of that vision. And then I think because teaching law was like actually a pretty good gig, you know, especially within the realm of law careers, like you have a good amount of freedom, you make a decent salary, you, you know, get to work with interesting, smart people and, you know, help people who are wanting to, you know, emerge with a career and a life. And there were a lot of things I really enjoyed about it. And I think because I liked it so much, I allowed myself to dream even bigger. And then, uh, you know, basically like out of nowhere, seemingly somebody I knew was like, have you ever thought of trying stand up? And then I did. And then I loved it. And the joke I have about it is that the first time I ever did stand up felt like a professional orgasm, which was basically like a regular orgasm, but I was a hundred percent sure that I was having it. And that's <laughs> told my therapist, um, which then led to some interesting conversations about my sex life. But anyway, I like said that to her in total seriousness because it did feel like that. It felt like this, like, oh my God, I didn't know that this could be so awesome and that I could just be me. You know, I think that was the, the main key with it. And so with the shows, like, you know, again, I mean, I, 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 I know that Oscar and I have done story shows together. Um, and so when there's like, there's this division between like storytelling and stand up, and they certainly, you know, interweave in all sorts of ways, like Mike Birbiglia, clearly a storyteller, also clearly a comedian, lots of other examples, but he's kind of like the big one that at least comes to my mind in terms of like having really long form stories. But, um, but I think it was because I was after honesty first and also the synthesis of my own life to mean something. Mm. And so that is always what I'm after. Um, and I hope I'm funny, but I, I didn't, it wasn't like I was like, I'm so funny. I got to do something with this. Like that was never the thing for me. Yeah, it's sounding like it was more a portal or means for your self-expression so that you could be yeah. in full authenticity all the time. Right. And then sometimes when I think of it that way, I'm like, oh, but like, I don't want it to be just about me. And then, you know, of course, like I recognize like, well, in the same way that you're inspired when other people fully express themselves and that gives you, you know, the kind of courage and, and allowance to be permission to be brave. So too, can you do that for other people? But there is something always when it's like, you know, framed as this like self-expression that I'm like, no, but I'm like doing it for other people. You know what I mean? So, um, but you're right. You're right. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. I mean, what you said about wanting to be on a stage from the very beginning, whether it's in the form of being a ballerina and then later teaching, 
I mostly what? identify as a ballerina. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do too. Yeah. Uh, but I wonder, what is it about the being on stage experience that's so captivating for you? Sure. And that's a great question. And it's something I think about like a lot because I, again, the goal is and has always been to be me and to be me in situations that um, are exciting and scary to me. And I guess like the maybe most basic and truthful, but inexplainable answer is that's what I see in my head. Um, I see stage, bright lights, huge crowd. Mm. Um, and there's a part of me that, you know, at various times has been ashamed of that. Um, and there's also a part of me that setting aside the shame is also interested in why, you know, cause it's like, okay, like I, I, I just, this is coming to mind. Like Ben Platt, who is a great performer and someone I, I don't know personally, but um, I love his work. And I have listened to like interviews where he's said that, you know, when he's on stage, that's like where he feels most at home. And I, you know, I'm probably paraphrasing in some way, but like I've heard him say that and other people say that too. And I, I always think about it. Like, I'm like, is that true for me? I'm not sure. Like, I don't have the sense like I'm home right now and I feel home. And if I were on a stage, I'd feel like I was on a stage and I get the difference between those two. And it's not the case that I feel like more at home in one or the other, but I guess there's this desire I've had from as long as I can remember. And maybe it does go back to that crying on a stage is just like, if I can conquer the being of my whole self on the stage and make it feel like home, mm. then I think I've integrated my, you know, selves, public, personal. And I think that's really what I've desired always. Like I have Holocaust grandparents in my lineage and uh, my grandmother on my mom's side, the story goes, you know, that she survived because she looked not Jewish and she was able to like walk the streets of Poland and find hiding spots as though she was not Jewish. And so she was able to like survive for her and my grandfather as a result of that. And I say that because one, I guess, you know, to some degree that sort of trauma, I believe trickles down. But then there's the other point, which is that there's this desire that I have had for as long as I can remember to integrate, to tell my whole truth, to be able to like, I don't know, it's like on the one hand, one could take an experience like that in one's heritage and think, okay, so it's important to hide details about yourself. But it's also possible to take the opposite lesson, which is like, she survived for us so that we could tell our whole truths and be our same selves when we're in hiding at home mm -hmm. and on a stage. And I think for me, it's something like that. Wow. There are a lot of layers there, right there. I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. That's life. Well, walk me to the beginning or the sort of beginning, like the beginning sure. after the ballerina beginning. But yeah. how did you even end up going to law school? Where did that interest in law come from? Well, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say it was an interest in law. Um, totally reasonable to frame it that way, but just not the case for me. Like, uh, again, that Holocaust trauma, I think, trickled down to my parents where I think in some way they believed that if I didn't have a career, like with graduate school and a diploma attached, that the Nazis were gonna come for them. Like, I think it carried through to that level because, you know, there was this talk, especially from my dad of like, nobody can ever take your education away from you. And I'm like, who wants it? You know, like at this point, I mean, I have all these degrees and now I'm a comedian, they're just like props, you know, like I, I don't like need any of the stuff that got me here and I'm grateful for it. I'm here because of it in many ways. Um, and I went because that's like what you did, what I did, what I, you know, like I was verbal and like good at reasoning and overthinking and an anxious person. And so it's like, okay, you could be a lawyer. Um, so I think 
that was why. Why did you go to law school? I went to law school out of default because I didn't know what else to do. Sure. Yeah. So, so. me, me too, in a way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But I, I love how you just framed it as now you have all these degrees and they're just props for you. Oh. To study. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder too, you know, as you were, so you spent some time working at a big law firm before mm -hmm. going to a law school. And these are relatively traditional paths for lawyers yes. if they want to pivot. Right. Um, and so I wonder if that was also part of the, this is part of what I think I should be doing. Was that still sort of that mentality you were in? Um, I guess, but it's also like in those moments, like, you know, there's, there's the thinking of like, you can only see, see when you're driving up until the next corner and like, there's a saving grace in that. Um, and so, you know, I went to work at a law firm because like there was on-campus interviewing happening and that was like what I could do. And then I guess to some degree what I thought I should do, but I don't know that I consciously thought of there being a difference at that time. It was just kind of like, well, yeah, like, duh, you know? Um, and then in, in terms of teaching, I mean, I did want to be a law professor. I had that goal because I was ambitious. I've always been ambitious despite myself, especially these days. I think when I was younger, I was more like, I want to be perfect. I want to have every, I want to get all A's and I want to be totally fit. And I, you know, like everything should be checked off. And I really got a lot of like, uh, I thought pleasure out of that. And then I had a, a real 180 on that sort of thinking, you know, I don't know exactly when, but like certainly somewhere through my teaching career. Cause I was like, I had early success both in getting the job at Hofstra because like those jobs, they're not easy to get. And I really did get lucky. Um, and the specifics of it are Hofstra had an outside of the box hiring strategy the year that I got hired. And so basically like, rather than going to the traditional law professor market, which is like a phone book of resumes that look exactly the same. And everybody went to Yale from kindergarten to, you know, their clerkship on the Supreme Court and they were writing the whole way. I mean, the kindergarten law review articles, super amazing. <laughs> uh, coloring and the law. Um, that's probably a literal <laughs> law review article that exists. But anyway, um, I cite to it often, so does the Supreme Court, but whatever. So I, I didn't have that story, and, but I did publish a piece when I was at school. And I, I wanted to do that, I had that in my mind. And it was sort of just like a personal goal. I was like, I just want to write something before I get out of here. And so I did. And it was then searchable on Westlaw, LexisNexis, whatever. And the year that Hofstra was hiring, rather than going through the traditional market, because it just kind of didn't yield what they wanted the past few years for them, they went outside and they looked up, you know, just through like search terms, right? Um, on the, the websites, you know, for people who wrote law review articles and went to, you know, these certain schools in the past however many years. And then I came up because I wrote a piece in law school. And then I get a letter at Freed Frank, check my mail, which I did mostly to check like the garbage, because like, what do you get? You get like brochures, you know what I mean? Like in your law firm mail. And then what, this letter, you know, is there. And I wasn't sure if it was spam because I just didn't know, but they ha it had a number of, you know, a guy who would soon be my colleague, like a year later. And I called and I was like, hey, sure, I would love to be a law professor. I didn't think that that was like, I mean, I didn't say this on the phone, but I didn't think that was going to be a reality for me because, you know, I imagine you know this also. There's like maybe this pipe dream that people have about it when they're in law school, but especially if you're at a good law school, you're like, okay, like, what do you think? You're Brad Pitt, you know, of that. And it's, it's honestly, it's one of the things that in what I do now, you know, entertaining, there's so much of that of just like, what do you think? You're going to like make it okay. Like I have been told that already with, cause I, I didn't have stellar grades in law school. I got lucky. Like what I've just described to you is basically a Cinderella story of how I ended up getting the job. Oh, and the end of it is I got the job, but like, you know, really unlikely, really low yield, 
just like any audition or becoming a movie star or whatever. And I don't know that I'm going to like achieve all of that, whatever that may be. But when there's this trope in this season of my life about like, you're not going to have your own show. You're not going to like have a talk show. You know, you're not, what do you think you're going to get like an HBO special? And it's like, yeah, I do. Um, and again, I don't know, but like, Law school taught me that precedent matters, um, and maybe it doesn't nowadays, but um, I can be my own Supreme Court, and uh, all of the justices can be RBG. So I can, you know, do that, I guess. I don't know. Right. I mean, you say luck, and sure, there isn't, you know, there is an element of that. It was happenstance that this random piece of mail showed up in your law, you know, your your law firm inbox. Yeah. I mean, you also set yourself up with the law review article that you had published and all the different yeah. opportunities you had done and accomplished to be yeah. in a position so that when the opportunity did arise, you were a good fit. For sure. Um, yeah. And also I opened the mail and right. I, you know, like I, I think the first time I was ever on stage, actually, I opened a package. I didn't know what to do, but I got a package on my way out the door to that first set. And I didn't know what I was going to do, but somebody told me it's good to be vulnerable. And I had a lot of trouble being vulnerable just as like a person, I think at that time. And then I was like, oh, but being vulnerable happens when you literally don't know the answer to something. I don't know what's in this package. Let me open this package on stage. Turns out it was a inherently funny set of vinyl suit covers that my mother had sent to me without my knowledge because she had been at my apartment, noticed that my white furry cat Mona perched herself atop the suits that I would wear to school. And therefore I had white cat hair all over my suits. And she said to me, Elizabeth, and I go by Liz, but you know, she paid for the whole name. So, and vowels are expensive anyway. So she's like, Elizabeth, you have to get these suit covers. And I said, sure, mommy, I'll get it. I'll get it. She knew I wouldn't. So she sends me them. And then I open them on stage and basically tell this whole story. And of course, the first rule of comedy is that vinyl suit covers are always funny. So it happened to work. But there too, I opened the mail. And so if there's one thing I could say in terms of like transitioning to a career of like fun or whatever from law, uh, if somebody would want to do that, um, not that law can't be fun, whatever. Um, I always am like so like conscious of that. I'm like, being a lawyer is amazing. And I'm like, was it? Um, but uh, <laughs> it's the best if you are weird. Um, but I, uh, no, I think if you actually have like the desire, then it could be great. Um, and there were elements of my career that were great and the people I met, et cetera. But anyway, if you're looking to leave, open the mail. Yes, open the mail. And then, so tell me, when did you and what did opening the mail look like to go from mm-hmm. teaching law to comedy? I know you had mentioned there were a couple. Yeah, I mean, so, there. right. It was basically like somebody, you know, offered me this chance to be on stage and I really had no idea what to do there, but um, I had a crush on her, so I knew she was going to be at the show. So I was like, okay. And uh, and then it was great. And I opened the mail. Um I did two, two sets actually. Like, I think they were like one, one week apart. Yeah. And so, uh, so the first set I opened the mail and the second set was kind of like a follow up on the first set and it was, you know, all over the place. Um, but it was funny because it was me. It wasn't funny because it was good. Um, and so that's, that's been the journey, you know, since then is kind of like living in that, you know, Ira Glass gap space of like, I know what I now, now I know what I think I'm going for, but like, I know that I'm not there yet. And when am I going to get there? At that time, I had no idea. And so it was good uh, in this way that it was pure. Um, But I I don't think, you know, like, even when I look at, at those like very early performances, there are elements that I'm like, oh, that was actually good. Uh, and I would then lose that for a couple of years only to then realize that I lost it to find it and get it back, et cetera. And, you know, there's tons in that process of sort of refining one's, I guess, like stage persona, but really it is what we were talking about earlier, that kind of integration between how am I actually, and what am I like on stage kind of thing. Right. Um, but, uh, but basically I was then, you know, doing comedy and I was teaching. And then 11 months after I did comedy for the first time, there was coincidentally this like budget moment at my school 
that all of the tenured faculty members of which I was then newly one of them uh, got buyout packages. And so I took one because I had already had this little bit of an inkling about like, you know, I think I, I think I want this to be my life. And I recognized that it was so wild and silly and ridiculous to like up and leave. Um, but then there was this opportunity that made it slightly less so. And again, I mean, it wasn't a letter in the mail, um, but mostly for legal reasons, <laughs> just because it's like when a school does that, I don't think they want a paper trail. So like, you know, David Latt doesn't get a hold of it and put it on blast, et cetera. I love David Latt. Um, but like, you know, that kind of thing, I, I think is the reason that there's no memo. Um, but, and also like, they're fine now and open, et cetera. But, uh, but anyway, in that moment, I received a phone call and had to like scribble down all of the different tranches of the buyout package and took one of the, the options. That's great. So there was sort of a cushion to yeah. tide you over. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like enough to never work again or anything like that. It was just sort of exactly what you say, that cushion. And it made something that seemed perhaps ridiculous, a little bit less ridiculous. Right. What is your creative process these days? Um, I mean, I do try and keep it loose, uh, but also I think it's because my nature is pretty tight. Uh, and I don't mean like as a writer or, you know, I don't mean it as a compliment. I mean it as like, a, like I'm tightly wound. And so I recognize that like, there's a part of me inherently that's like a lawyer. And so the more that I can, like, I guess what I try to do is use the good parts of that and ditch the bad parts of that for being creative. And so, you know, uh, I like, I, I do write, act, and I do stand up. And so I write every day. I start my day writing. Um, I make sure to, you know, keep kind of a regular schedule of like posting on social media uh, in order to share stuff with people, but also to like kind of keep myself accountable of like how, how many jokes are we actually writing? What are we working on? And then uh, I also edit videos of myself. And so I have, I have like a, a, a lot of old videos, like a lot of my work um, is basically like revisiting things that have happened in my life. And so I've done, you know, pre-quarantine, I, I have this thing called minute memoir or minute memoir. And that's something that's a little more like produced where I play characters from stories that have happened in my life. But then quarantine has been an interesting moment because I, for, again, I mean, it's kind of like, I've set myself up well with it, but I, I don't know that I knew exactly what I was doing all along the way, but I have a lot of footage of my own life and I have kept it. And now I'm in this moment where I'm putting it together to tell stories where I am interjecting commentary on prior things that have happened to me, um, which isn't so different from the minute memoir but it's a little different in the sense that it is original source. And so I'm working on an album now called Primary Sources, and it's basically like Primary Sources is a, a nod to the fact that there are original pieces of footage in the piece, but also that like, it's the story of how I quit various things such as smoking, alcohol, drugs, and my job, and all of them in some way come from some message from the universe, AKA a primary source. Yeah, that's fascinating. I love that you have now this power of hindsight as you layer on your commentary. What are some of the yeah. themes that you're observing in your commentary? Um, well, I guess that there's a way when I'm commenting on myself that there's a little bit of an effortlessness to the humor um, where like sometimes, I, I mean, I, I think most comedians do go through this where it's kind of like, you know, you're funny, but then you're trying to be funny and trying isn't funny. Um, and so then it's like, you want to get it more natural and that's common. At least, you know, I, I've heard that from a lot of people, but I think that, um, I, 
again, because like my main focus has not always been jokes. There's like a real tension that I've felt when I'm like, okay, I have this bit and it works, but like, ugh, like really. And I, I, I don't, you know, I guess like we all think we're terminally unique. And so, you know, I'm not immune from that affliction, but I guess like, I don't know. I don't think so much about making the bit work, you know, like I want it, but I'm like, I just want to be honest. And so because that's been such a focus for me, I think that like me looking at my own footage and the process of like, Hey, look, I've grown. Um, is so much more satisfying to me. Like a couple of things, I, I, my favorite show growing up was The Wonder Years and it was predicated on this fundamental misunderstanding of The Wonder Years that I perceived as this magical moment. But when I watched that show where Fred Savage is reacting on your screen to the voice of Daniel Stern that we hear over the reaction and visual of Fred Savage's face, when I saw that, I was eight or nine, I was like, oh my God, somebody has my brain where in one moment they're a grown up and a kid. And I, my first, first memory was telling my mom, I was like spacing out at our apartment and my mom's like, what are you thinking about Elizabeth? And I was like, mommy, one day today will be a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I got to call my sister about this one. But like setting that aside, it was also like, I have really, my earliest memory has been this awareness of like, someday we'll be remembering this. And again, I mean, I imagine that other people have had versions of that. And I've certainly seen, you know, resonant strands and things I've read and things I've watched, et cetera. But I think for me, it's really been this like life mantra thing you know, despite myself, in spite of myself, and if there's a thing that I think could come through me that is my unique expression, it is that kind of like, hey, I'm me, and I know I'm not done or perfect, but like, look at that person <laughs> who's also me, but like, I mean, you know, there's the Mike Birbiglia line of like, I'm in the future also, and I, that's great, um, and his, and I think you know, certainly that's like part of the reason that I've like resonated so heavily with him and the Wonder Years and other people, but also like, I really am obsessive about it. Like where I'm like, no, 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 I'm crying right now. Hey, Vic, my brother, can you film me? Because I think I'm going to want this one day. And then I do. Like, it's not like, it's like every sweater that Marie Kondo tells me to throw away, I'm happy. So, such a genius book and person. Every video that I keep on my cloud or hard drive, I'm happy that I have. And now you have this grand footage of your entire life. Yeah. That's a bad. Yeah, it's, it's nice. And like, so sometimes when people are like, how can people find you? I'm like, I don't know, break into my house and see my computer. You know, I, please don't do that. Um, but <laughs> like, that's, it's like, where did, where does your work live? I'm like, I hoard it on this machine that I guard with my life. Um, and I'm, I'm slowly, you know, kind of coming to, I think a place of releasing some of that, um, and that's what I've been working on primarily now, but, uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been sort of long coming. Yeah. One day will be a long time. What was the phrase? Yeah. One day today will be a long time ago. Yeah. I'm going to think about that one for a long time. Mm. What do you want your legacy to be? I would love that. You know, I would love to, uh, to very bravely, boldly, and in a fun way, look back on my experiences and all the things that I thought were so devastatingly shameful in certain moments and laugh at them and, and do that, you know, so that some other person watching could watch it and I don't know, misinterpret it in some way that makes their life project meaningful. Right. Where do you think that shame comes from? Why do we go through these experiences of shame? Um, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I really just don't know. Like, I think 
that the stuff that comes to mind when answering that is like, I don't know exactly about past lives or anything like that, but like, I, I think it's possible that, you know, there's some spirit journey that, you know, maybe somebody in a past life who had my spirit or a version of it needed to work that out. Yeah. Cause I don't know. I mean, you know, I think there have been times when I was younger and less therapied and less aware that I was like, it's my parents. But I'm like, it's not. Um, and I, I think I would have had it regardless. So I don't know where it comes from. Yeah. No, it's an interesting realization when you're like, wait, I am the common denominator to all of my experiences. Right. And it's kind <laughs> of like, yeah, a hundred percent. And, and it's also like, it's, I've found that it's way more powerful for me to work with it and, you know, to, to kind of use it because if I didn't have that much shame, I don't think that I'd be as interested in working through it and making it my life project to kind of like air it out for the purpose of understanding it, hopefully becoming a better person and, you know, bringing it to a stage of some kind so that somebody else can look at it and be like, Oh my God, like, I also lied about knowing Russian during an interview with a law firm and got caught, you know, or whatever, whatever that makes someone think of in terms of like, kind of a lie that they told because they thought that they should, you know, or some version of that. Right. Well, I think that's truly where the gift is when we share that those experiences that we associate shame with, shining light on those moments yeah. and having it witnessed by other humans. Right. Realize right. actually, oh, I'm actually not that unique. This is actually yeah. completely normal right. and it's fine. And it's so funny how once we speak it into existence, mm -hmm. it actually dissipates a lot. Yeah. Well, and that's also part of the reason, like when I look at my old footage, one of the striking things that I notice is it's not so much about like, oh, I was I was telling jokes in a cleaner way or I was better at acting like, sure, I guess. But like really the loss and the shedding of shame is what I see the most because I do watch so much footage of myself. And so I look at myself, I'm like, oh my God, I couldn't like say that without looking down or, you know, just these like little ticks and physical details that tell a larger story if you're looking for them. Um, and then if you're the later version of yourself commenting on them. Yeah, powerful. Well, Liz, is there anything else that you would like to share with our watchers today? I mean, you know, um, open the mail. I think that if there's, I don't know, like I, I'm trying to think of like something inspiring. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. <laughs> yeah, like I I think that if the the things that have helped me have been listening and being willing to shift, pivot and just like recognizing instances where I feel resistance and thinking about why giving up on having to be right about my past choices, being willing to flow you know, when, when those things arise, um, that's probably been some of the bigger lessons. Yeah. Open the mail. Be flexible. Yeah. 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 Be human. Yeah. 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 How can we find you? Do you have any upcoming shows or anything that we should be sure to check out? Sure. Yeah. I mean, my Instagram and website, my Instagram is at Liz Glazer. My website is dearlizglazer.com. And then also Twitter is at Elizabeth Glazer. Um, I use my full name there because I always feel like I'm in trouble there. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I do like online shows now in quarantine. I'm not eager to do like live stuff. I just like, this feels strange and unsafe. Uh, but, um, so I don't really publicize the online ones as much, but they do happen. And if someone's super interested in logging in, then, you know, you could ask me. Uh, but I trust that, I mean, when, when I used to go live on stage, I told people when and where. So when that happens again, I'll do that too. But yeah, if you, if you go to those places, uh, you'll find my album when it comes out and, videos and whatever. I can't wait. And you have a YouTube channel too. So we should make sure yeah. we subscribe. Yeah. Yeah. 
Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Andrea. Was, yes. today. I've thank so you. enjoyed it. And I'm just so delighted that our paths crossed and we're thank willing you. to participate. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to call a wrap on that today. If you've enjoyed this conversation with Liz, be sure you hit like and subscribe for future videos. And I would also love to hear what you learned today. You can drop a comment below or you can write me through my website, andreayangcoaching.com. See you next time.